Hello and welcome back. Glad you've all tuned in. And I have come across a story, this story which fascinated me, on Prince Harry's ghostwriter for his book Spare, J.R. Moringer. And he talks about his collaboration on the memoir. And it was such an intimate article written by him. So I want to share with you some standouts. So let's get into this. The author starts off by writing, quote, I was exasperated with Prince Harry. My head was pounding, my jaw was clenched, and I was starting to raise my voice. And yet, some part of me was still able to step outside the situation and think, this is so weird. I'm shouting at Prince Harry. Then, as Harry started going back at me, as his cheeks flushed and his eyes narrowed, a more pressing thought occurred. Whoa, it could all end right here. This was the summer of 2022. For two years, I had been the ghostwriter on Harry's memoir, Spare. And now, reviewing his latest edits, in a middle-of-the-night Zoom session, we'd come to a difficult passage. Harry, at the close of a grueling military exercise in rural England, gets captured by pretend terrorists. It's a simulation, but the tortures inflicted upon Harry are very real. He's hooded, dragged to an underground bunker, beaten, frozen, starved, stripped, forced into excruciating stress positions by captors wearing black balaclavas. The idea is to find out if Harry has the toughness to survive an actual capture on the battlefield. Two of his fellow soldiers don't. They crack. At last, Harry's captors throw him against a wall, choke him, and scream insults into his face, culminating in a vile dig at Princess Diana. Even the fake terrorists engrossed in their parts, even the hardcore British soldiers observing from a remote location, seem to recognize that an inviolate rule has been broken. Clawing that specific wound, the memory of Harry's dead mother is out of bounds. When the simulation is over, one of the participants extends an apology. Harry always wanted to end the scene with a thing he had said to his captors, a comeback that struck me as unnecessary and somewhat inane. Good for Harry that he had the nerve, but ending with what he said would dilute the scene's meaning. That even at the most bizarre and peripheral moments of his life, his central tragedy intrudes. For months, I'd been crossing out the comeback, and for months, Harry had been pleading for it to go back in. Now, he wasn't pleading, he was insisting, and it was 2 a.m. I was starting to lose it. I said, dude, we've been over this. Why was this one line so important? Why couldn't he just accept my advice? We were leaving out a thousand other things. That's half the art of memoir, leaving stuff out. So what made this different? Please, I said, trust me, trust the book. Although this wasn't the first time Harry and I had argued, it felt different. It felt as if we were hurtling towards some kind of decisive rupture, in part because Harry was no longer saying anything. He was just glaring into the camera. Finally, he exhaled and calmly explained that all his life people had belittled his intellectual capabilities and this flash of cleverness proved that even after being kicked and punched and deprived of sleep and food, he had his wits about him. Oh, I said. Okay. It made sense now, but I still refused. Why? Because I told him everything you said is about you. You want the world to know that you did a good job, that you were smart. But strange as it may seem, memoir isn't about you. It's not even about the story of your life. It's a story carved from your life, a particular series of events, chosen because they have the greatest resonance for the widest range of people. And at this point in the story, those people don't need to know anything more than your captors said a cruel thing about your mom. Harry looked down. A long time. Was he thinking? Seething? Should I have been more diplomatic? Should I have just given in? I imagined I'd be thrown off the book soon after sunup. I could almost hear the awkward phone call with Harry's agent. And I was sad. 
Never mind the financial hit, I was focused on the emotional shock. All the time, the effort, the intangibles I'd invested in Harry's memoir, in Harry, would be gone, just like that. After what seemed like an hour, Harry looked up and we locked eyes. Okay, he said. Okay, yes, I get it. Thank you, Harry, I said, relieved. He shot me a mischievous grin. Quote, I really enjoyed getting you worked up like that. I burst into laughter and shook my head, and we moved on to his next set of edits. The author goes on to write, Later that morning, after a few hours of sleep, I sat outside. Mornings are my worry time, along with afternoons and evenings. I didn't worry so much about the propriety of arguing with princes or even the risks. One of a ghostwriter's main jobs is having a big mouth. You win some, you lose most. But you have to keep pushing, not unlike a demanding parent or a tyrannical coach. So he goes on to ask, No, rather than the rightness of going after Harry, I was questioning the heat with which I'd done so. And he also reminded himself it wasn't his book. So I'll skip ahead. In his article, he goes on to talk about how he's had other experiences ghostwriting. So there is this interesting excerpt here. He talks about the book Open by Andre Agassi, which he, of course, helps ghost write. And he talked about this interview that he had. So he says this, quote, The host was praising Open. And Agassi was being his typical, charming, humble self. Now the host was praising the writing. Agassi continued to be humble. Thank you, thank you. But I dared to hope he might mention me. An indefensible, illogical hope. Andre had asked me to put my name on the cover and I declined. Nevertheless, right before zonking out, I started muttering at the TV. Say my name. I got a bit louder. Say my name. I got pretty rowdy. <laughs> he went on to say the same, but adding a few expletives. Seven hours later, he says, I stumbled downstairs to the breakfast room and caught a weird vibe. Guests stared. Several peered over my shoulder to see who was with me. What? I sat alone eating some pancakes until I got it. The bed and breakfast had to be 300 years old with walls made of pre-revolutionary cardboard. Clearly, every guest had heard me. Say my name! I took it as a lesson. NyQuil was to blame, but also creeping narcissism. He said, I'm not cut out for this ghostwriting thing. I need to get back to my first love, journalism, to writing my own books. <laughs> so that was quite interesting as well. So let's move a bit forward in the article. He went on to talk about his career. He said he went back to magazine writing. He also dared to start another novel because one he wrote before was panned by the critics. And he said this, There was no time for anything else. And then he talked about how he kept hearing calls for him to do more ghostwriting. He said, Twice I said yes, not for the money. I'd never taken a ghosting gig for the money. But twice I felt I had no choice. That the story was too cool, the author just too compelling. And twice the author freaked out at my first draft. Twice I explained that first drafts are always flawed. That error is the mother of truth. But it wasn't just the errors. It was the confessions, the revelations, the cold-blooded honesty that memoir requires. Everyone says they want to get raw until they see how raw feels. Twice the author killed the book, twice I sat before a stack of pages into which I'd poured my soul and years of my life, knowing that they were good and knowing that they were about to go into a drawer forever. Twice I said to my wife, never again. And then, in the summer of 2020, I got a text. The familiar query, Would you be interested in speaking with someone about ghosting a memoir? I shook my head, no. I covered my eyes. I picked up the phone and heard myself blurting. Who? Prince Harry. I agreed to a Zoom. I was curious, of course. Who wouldn't be? I wondered what the real story was. I wondered if we'd have any chemistry. 
We did, and there was, I think, a surprising reason. Princess Diana had died 23 years before our first conversation, and my mother, Dorothy Moringer, had just died, and our griefs felt equally fresh. Still, I hesitated. Harry wasn't sure how much he wanted to say in his memoir, and that concerned me. I'd heard similar reservations early on from both authors who'd ultimately killed their memoirs. Also, I knew that whatever Harry said, whenever he said it, would set off a storm. I am not by nature a storm chaser, and there were logistical considerations. In the early stages of a global pandemic, it was impossible to predict when I'd be able to sit down with Harry in the same room. How do you write about someone you can't meet? Harry had no deadlines, however, and that enticed me. Many authors are in a hot hurry, and some ghosts are happy to oblige. They churn and burn, producing three or four books a year. I go painfully slow. I don't know any other way. Also, I just like the dude. I called him dude right away. It made him chuckle. I found a story, as he outlined it in broad strokes, relatable and infuriating. The way he'd been treated, both by strangers and intimates, was grotesque. In retrospect, though, I think I selfishly welcomed the idea of being able to speak with someone, an expert, about that never-ending feeling of wishing you could call your mom. Harry and I made steady progress in the course of 2020, largely because the world didn't know what we were up to. We could revel in the privacy of our Zoom bubble. As Harry grew to trust me, he brought other people into the bubble, connecting me with his inner circle. A vital phase in every ghosting job. There is always someone who knows your author's life better than he does, and your task is to find that person fast and interview his socks off. As the pandemic waned, I was able to travel to Montecito. I went once with my wife and children. Harry won the heart of my daughter, Gracie, with his vast Moana scholarship. His favorite scene, he told her, is when the silly chicken finds himself lost at sea. I also went twice by myself. Harry put me up in his guest house where Megan and Archie would visit me on their afternoon walks. Megan, knowing I was missing my family, was forever bringing trays of food and sweets. Little by little, Harry and I amassed hundreds of thousands of words. When we weren't Zooming or phoning, we were texting around the clock. In due time, no subject was off the table. I felt honored by his candor, and I could tell that he felt astonished by it and energized. While I always emphasized storytelling and end scenes, Harry couldn't escape the wish that Spare might be a rebuttal to every lie published about him. As Borges dreamed of endless libraries, Harry dreams of endless retractions, which meant no end of revelations. He knew, of course, that some people would be aghast at first. Why on earth would Harry talk about that? But he had faith that they would soon see, because someone else already talked about it and got it wrong. He was joyful at this prospect. Everything in our bubble was good. Then, someone leaked news of the book. Whoever it was, their callousness towards Harry extended to me. I had a clause in my contract giving me the right to remain unidentified, a clause I always insisted on. But the leaker blew that up by divulging my name to the press, along with pretty much Anyone who has had anything to do with Harry. I woke one morning to find myself squinting into a gigantic searchlight. Every hour, another piece would drop. Each one wrong. My fee was wrong. My bio was wrong. Even my name. One royal expert cautioned that because of my involvement in the book, Harry's father should be, quote, looking for a pile of coats to hide under, end quote. When I mentioned this to Harry, he stared. Why? Because I have daddy issues, we laughed and got back to discussing our mothers. The genesis of my relationship with Harry was constantly misreported. Harry and I were introduced by George Clooney, the British newspapers proclaimed, even though I'd never met George Clooney. Yes, he was directing a film based on my memoir, but I've never been in the man's presence, never communicated with him in any way. I wanted to correct the record, write an op-ed or something, tweet, some facts, but no, I remained myself. Ghosts don't speak. One day, though, I did share my frustration with Harry. I bemoaned that these fictions about me were spreading and hardening into orthodoxy. He tilted his head. Welcome to my world, dude. By now, Harry was calling me dude. A week before its pub date, Spare was leaked. 
a Madrid bookshop reportedly put embargoed copies of the spare version on its shelves by accident, in quotes. The report just descended. In no time, Fleet Street had assembled crews of translators to reverse engineer the book from Spanish to English. And with so many translators working on tight deadlines, the results read like a bad Borat. One example among many was a passage about Harry losing his virginity. Per the British press, Harry recounts, quote, I mounted her quickly, but of course he doesn't. I can assert with 100% confidence that no one gets mounted, in quotes, quickly or otherwise in spare. I didn't have time to be horrified. When the book was officially released, the bad translations didn't stop. They multiplied. The British press now converted the book into their native tongue, that jabberwocky of bonkers, hot takes, and classist snark. Facts were wrenched out of context. Complex emotions were reduced to cartoonish idiocy. Innocent passages were hyped into outrages, and there were so many falsehoods. One British newspaper chased down Harry's flight instructor. Headline, Prince Harry's army instructor says, Story in spare book is complete fantasy in quotes. Hours later, the instructor posted a lengthy comment beneath the article swearing that those words, complete fantasy in quotes, never came out of his mouth. Indeed, they were nowhere in the piece, only in the bogus headline, which had gone viral. The newspaper had made it up, the instructor said, stressing that Harry was one of his finest students. The only other time I'd witnessed this sort of frenzied mob was with LeBron James, whom I'd interviewed before and after his decision to leave Cleveland Cavaliers enjoying Miami Heat. I couldn't fathom the toxic cloud of hatred against him. He also goes on to add later, within days, the amorphous campaign against Spare seemed to narrow to a single point of attack. That Harry's memoir, rigorously fact-checked, was rife with errors. I can't think of anything that rankles quite like being called sloppy by people who routinely trample facts in pursuit of their royal prey. And this now happened every few minutes to Harry and, by extension, to me. In one section of the book, for instance, Harry reveals that he used to live for the yearly sales at TK Maxx, the discount clothing chain. Not so fast, said the monarchists at TK Maxx corporate, who rushed out with a statement declaring that TK Maxx never has sales, just great savings all the time. Oh snap, gotcha, Prince George Santos except that people around the world immediately posted screenshots of TK Maxx, touting sales on its official Twitter account. Surely TK Maxx's effort to discredit Harry's memoir was unrelated to the company's long-standing partnership with Prince Charles and his charitable trust. Ghostwriters don't speak. I reminded myself over and over, but I had to do something, so I ventured one small gesture. I retweeted a few quotes from Mary Carr about inadvertent error in memories and memoir, plus seemingly innocuous quotes from Spare about the way Harry's memory works. He can't recall much from the years right after his mother died and for the most part remembers places better than people, possibly because places didn't let him down the way people did. Smooth move, Ghost Rider. My tweets were seized upon, deliberately misinterpreted by trolls, turned into headlines by real news outlets. Harry's Ghost Rider admits the book is all lies. One of Harry's friends gave a book party my wife and I attended. We were feeling fragile as we arrived, and it had nothing to do with Twitter. Days earlier, we'd been stalked followed in our car as we drove our son to preschool. When I lifted him out of his seat, a paparazzo leaped from his car and stood in the middle of the road, taking aim with his enormous lens and scaring the hell out of everyone at drop-off. Then, not one hour later, as I sat at my desk trying to call myself, I looked up to see a woman's face at my window. As if in a dream, I walked to the window and asked, Who are you? Through the glass, she whispered, I'm from the Mail on Sunday. I lowered the shade, phoned an old friend, the same friend whose columns I used to ghostwrite in Colorado. He listened, but didn't get it. How could he get it? So I called the only friend who might. It was like telling Taylor Swift about a bad breakup. It was like singing Hallelujah to Leonard Cohen. Harry was all heart. He asked if my family was okay, he asked for physical descriptions of the people harassing us, promised to make some calls, see if anything could be done. We both knew nothing could be done, but still, 
I felt gratitude and some regret. I'd worked hard to understand the ordeals of Harry Windsor, and now I saw that I understood nothing. Empathy is thin gruel compared to the marrow of experience. One morning of what Harry had endured since birth made me desperate to seek to take another crack at the pages in spirit that talk about the media. Too late, the book was out, the party in full swing. As we walked into the house, I looked around, nervous and sure of what state we'd find the author in. Was he too feeling fragile? Was he as keen as I was to organize a global boycott of TK Maxx? <laughs> he appeared marching towards us, looking flushed. Uh-oh, I thought before registering that it was a good flush. His smile was wide as he embraced us both. He was overjoyed by many things. The numbers, naturally, Guinness World Records had just certified his memoir as the fastest-selling non-fiction book in the history of the world. But more than that, readers were reading, at last, the actual book, not murdoch chunks laced with poison, and their online reviews were overwhelmingly effusive. Many said Harry's candor about family dysfunction, about losing a parent, had given them solace. The guests were summoned into the living room. There were several lovely toasts to Harry. Then the prince stepped forward. I'd never seen him so self-possessed and expansive. He thanked his publishing team, his editor, me. He mentioned my advice to trust the book and said he was glad that he did because it felt incredible to have the truth out there, to feel his voice caught free. There were tears in his eyes, mine too. And yet, once a ghost, always a ghost. I couldn't help obsessing about that word, free. If he'd used that in one of our Zoom sessions... I'd have pushed back. Harry first felt liberated when he fell in love with Meghan, and again when they fled Britain, and what he felt now for the first time in his life was heard. That imperious Windsor motto, never complain, never explain, is really just a prettified omerta, which my wife suggests might have prolonged Harry's grief, his family actively discouraging talking, a stoicism for which they are widely lauded, but if you don't speak your emotions, you serve them, and if you don't tell your story, you lose it. Or what might be worse, you get lost inside it. Telling is how we cement details, preserve continuity, stay sane. We say ourselves into being every day or else. Heard, Harry, heard. I could hear myself making the case to him late at night, and I could see Harry's nose wrinkle as he argued for his word and I reproached myself once more. Not your blank book. After we hugged Harry goodbye, after we thanked Megan for toys she sent our children, I had a second thought about silence. Ghosts don't speak, says who. Maybe they can. Maybe sometimes they should. So there are those standouts from the article by J.R. Moringer, where he talks about his time with Prince Harry collaborating on the book Spare. As you saw, he went in-depth and gave us that behind the scenes on how his relationship with Prince Harry progressed. And you can see that they truly moved to a point where he does consider Harry his friend. Um, so what a unique relationship to have someone open up to him on such a level. And I just wanted to share these standouts with you. So now share your standouts with me in the comment section below. And if you want to watch my in-depth review of the book Spare, I guarantee you, you cannot miss that one. You will enjoy it. So click the link in the card and in the end screen and I will see you there. And now as always, before we log off, a special thank you to those who support this channel financially. To my Patreon, PayPal, and membership supporters, I would like to say thank you. And I would like to shout out by name, Bunny. Thank you for being such a longtime supporter of this channel. I value and appreciate you for your love that you've shown me. And I want you to know that you are so, so dear to me. And I really appreciate your partnership on this channel. A special thank you right now as well to you, James Calvin Daniels, another longtime supporter of this channel. I want to say thank you to you and God bless you for your generosity. Thank you. A special thank you now to Anna M. Jackson as well. Anna, I want to say please accept my deepest thanks to you. You've been such a faithful friend and a supporter through all the years and I'm so moved by your love. Thank you. And a very special thank you to Betty Wright. Betty, I'm so moved when I think about how generous you have been here. And I just want to say that I truly am so blessed to know you. Thank you. Thank you for your love. 
Thank you to those who gave through super thanks. Thank you to Rochelle Cherry, who is also a supporter on this channel. What a treasure you are. You are so kind and so dear. I appreciate you for your tremendous generosity towards my work here. God bless you. Thank you. Once again, thank you to all who like, comment, and share. And thank you to all who support this channel. And if you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Click subscribe. It truly does help out the channel. If you want to watch more videos, check out and click the links in the cards and at the end screen. And I will see you there. Thank you all for watching. Have a great day. And I will catch you in the next one. Have a blessed one.